Ashley Brock Rainey, Nora Roberts book, Sea Swept, Chapter 5. Anna got into work early. Odds were her supervisor would already be at her desk. You could always count on Marlo Johnson, Johnston to be at her desk or within hailing distance. Marlo was a woman Anna both admired and respected. When she needed advice, there was no one whose opinion she valued more. When she poked her head in around the open office door, Anna smiled a little. As expected, Marlo was there, buried behind the files and paperwork on her cluttered desk. She was a small woman, barely topping five feet. She wore her hair clothes cropped for convenience as much as style. Her face was smooth like polished it. Ebony, in the expression on her, could contain, remain composed even during the worst in crisis. Calm Center, who was now Anna, Calm Center, who was how Anna often thought of Marlowe. Though now she could be calm with her life, was filed with demanding career. Two teenage boys in a house that Anna had seen for herself was constantly crowded with people was beyond her. Anna often thought she wanted to be Marlowe Johnston when she grew up. Got a minute? Sure do. Marlo's voice was quick and lively, right with the southern shore accent that cut words between a draw and a twang. She waved Anna to a chair with one hand and fiddled with a round gold ball in her left ear. The Quindalot in her case. Right the first time, there were a couple of faxes waiting for me yesterday from the Quinn's lawyer, a Baltimore firm. What did our Baltimore lawyer have to say? The gist of it is that they're planning... They're pursuing guardianship. He'll be pushing through a petition to the court. They've been s they're very serious about keeping Seth the Lautner at their home and under their care. And it's an unusual situation, Marlo. Up till now, I've only spoken with one of the brothers, the one who lived in Europe until recently. Cameron. Impressions. He certainly makes one, because Marla was also a friend and allowed herself to grin and roll over her eyes. A treat to look at. I came across him when he was repairing the back porch steps. Can't say he looked like a happy man, but he was certainly a determined one. There was a lot of anger there and a lot of grief. What impressed me the most, other than his looks, other than his looks, Anna agreed with a chuckle, was the fact that he never questioned keeping Seth. It was a simple fact. He called Seth his brother. He meant it. I'm not sure he knows exactly how he feels about it, but he meant it. She went on while Marlowe listened without com comment. Detailing the conversation, Cam's willingness to change his life and his lifestyle, his concerns that Seth would bolt if he were taken out of the house. And, she continued, and, she continued, after speaking with Seth, I tend to agree with him. You think the boy's a runner? When I suggested foster care, he became angry, resentful, and afraid. If he feels threatened, he'll run. She thought of all the children who ended up on the mean streets of inner cities, homeless, desperate. She thought of all what he did to survive, and she thought of how many didn't survive at all. It was her job to keep this one child, this one boy, safe. He wants to stay there, Marlo. Maybe he needs to. His feelings about his mother are very strong and very negative. I suspect abuse, but he's not ready to discuss it, at least not with me. Is any word on the mother's whereabouts? No. We have no idea where she is or what she'll do. She signed papers allowing Ray Quinn to begin in adoption proceedings, but he died before they were finalized. If she comes back and wants her son, and she could, the Quinns would have a fight on their hands. You sound as though you're being in their corner. I'm in Seth's. Anna said firmly, and I'm going to stay there. I spoke with his teachers. He pulled out a file as he spoke. I have my report on that. I'm going to back today to speak with some of the neighbors and hopefully to meet with all three of the Quins. Maybe possible to stop the temporary guardianship until I complete the initial study, but I'm inclined against it. The boy needs stability. He needs to feel wanted. And even if the Quins only want it because of a promise, it's more than he's had before, I believe. Marla took the file so sorry. I signed this case to you because you don't look just at the surface, and I sent you in cold because I wanted you to take. Now, I'll tell you what I know about the Quins. You know them? Anna, I was born and raised on the shore. She smiled beautifully. It was a simple fact, but one she had great pride in. Ray Quinn was one of my professors at college. I admired him tremendously. When I had my two boys, Stella Quinn was their pediatrician until we moved to Princess Anne. We adored her. When I was driving out there yesterday, I kept wishing I'd had the chance to meet them. They were exceptional people, Marlo said simply. Ordinarily, even simple, in some ways, and exceptional. Here's a case in point. She had to lean back in her chair. I graduated from college 16 years ago. 
The three queens were teenagers. Your stories now and again. Maybe they were a little wild, and people wondered why Rain Stella had taken on half grown men with bad tendencies. I was pregnant with Johnny, my first work <sighs> my first working my butt off to get my degree and help my husband Ben pay the rent. He was working two jobs. We wanted a better life for ourselves, and we sure as hell wanted one for the baby I was carrying. She paused. Turn the double picture frame on her desk to a closer angle so that she could see her two young men smile at her. I wondered too, figured I wondered too, figured they were crazy or just playing at being Samaritans. Professor Quinn called me into his office one day, missed a couple classes, had the worst case of morning sickness known to woman. Still made her grimace. I swear I don't understand how some women reminisce over that kind of thing. In any case, thought it was going to rep remind me dropping his class, which meant losing the credits to my degree. With me an inch away, an inch away, and I would be the first in my family with a college degree. I was ready to fight. Instead, he wanted to know what he could do to help. I was speechless. She smiled, remembering, then beamed over at him. You know how impersonal college can be? The huge lectures where a student is just one more face in the crowd. But he noticed me. He'd taken the time to find out something about my situation. I burst into tears. Hormones, she said with a weird grin. Well, he patted my hand, gave me some tissues, and let me cry it out. I was on scholarship, and if my grades dropped or I blew a class, I could lose it. I only had one more semester. He said for me not to worry. We'd work it all out, and I was going to get my degree. He started talking about this and that to calm me down. He told me some stories about teaching his son to drive. It made me laugh. It wasn't until later I realized he hadn't been talking about one of the boys he'd taken in, because that's not what they were to him. They were his. Sucker for a happy and I side. And you got your degree. <laughs> he made sure I did. I own for that. Which is why I didn't tell you about this until you formed some impression of your own. As for the three Quins, I don't really know them. I've seen them at two funerals, so I'll set the lot with them at Professor Quinn's. For personal reasons, I'd like to see them have a chance to be a family, but... She laid her hands palm to palm. The best interest of the boy comes before that, in the structure of the system. You're thorough, Anna, and you believe in structure and in the system. Professor Quinn would have wanted what's best for Seth to repay an old debt I gave him you. And I blew out a long breath. No pressure, huh? Pressure's all we've got around here. As if on cue, her phone began to ring. And the clock's running. In a rust. I'd better get to work then. Looks like I'll be in the field most of the day. It was nearly 1 p.m. when Anna pulled up in the Quinn's drive. She managed to conduct interviews with three of the five names Cam had given her the day before. She hoped to expand on that before too much more time passed. Her call to Philip Quinn's office in Baltimore had given her the information that he was on leave for the next two weeks. She was hoping she would find him here and be able to file an impression of another Quinn. But it was the pup who greeted her. He barked ferociously, even as he backed rapidly away from her. Anna watched with amusement as he peed on himself in terror. With a laugh, she crouched down out of hand. Come on, cutie, I won't hurt you. Aren't you sweet? Aren't you pretty? She kept mummering to him until he bellied over to sniff her hand, then rolled over in ecstasy as she scratched him. For all you know, he's got fleas and rabies. Anna glanced up and saw Cam in the front door. For all I know, so do you. It was a snort of a laugh, and his hands tucked in his pockets. He came out on the porch with his brown suit today, he noted, for the life of him. Couldn't figure why she picked such dull color. I guess you're willing to risk it since you're back. Didn't expect you so soon. A boy's welfare is at stake, Mr. Quinn. I don't believe in taking my time under the circumstances. Obviously charmed by her voice, the puppy leaped up and bathed her face. The giggle escaped before she could stop it. The sound of May came raised his eyebrows and defended herself from the puppy's eager tongue. She rose, tucking down her jacket in her dignity. May I come in? Why not? This time he waited for her. Even opened the door. And let her go ahead of him. She saw a large, fairly tidy living room. Her door showed some wear, but appeared comfortable and colorful. The spinet in the corner caught her eye. Do you play? No, really. Without realizing it, Cam ran a hand over the wood. He didn't notice that his fingers left sticks in it. My mother dead, and Philip's got an ear for it. I tried to reach your brother Philip at his office this morning. He's out buying groceries. Because he was pleased that won that battle, can't smile a little. He's going to be living here. For the foreseeable future. He's in two. You work fast. A boy's welfare is at stake. He said, echoing her. Anna nodded. At a distant rumble of thunder, she glanced outside, frowned. The light was dimming, and the wind began to kick up. I'd like to discuss sets with you. She shifted her briefcase, glancing out of here. Is this going to take long? I couldn't say. Then let's do it in the kitchen. I want coffee. 
Fine. She followed him, using the time to study the house. It was just neat enough to make her wonder if Cam had been expecting her. They passed the den where the dust was laid over tables. The couch was covered with newspapers and shoes littered the floor. Missed that, didn't you? She thought with a smirk. She found it enduring. Then she heard his quick and vicious oath, nearly jumped out of her pit. Practical shoes. God damn it. Shit. What the hell is this? What next? Jesus Christ. He was already sloshing through water. Suds flowing over the kitchen floor. Slap at the dishwasher. Anna stepped back to avoid the flood. I'll turn that off if I were you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I've got to take the bitch apart. He dragged the door open. An ocean of snowy white suds spewed out. Anna bit the inside of her cheek. Cleared her throat. Uh, what kind of soap did you use? Dish soap. Vibrating with frustration, he yanked a bucket out from one of thing. Dishwasher soap or dishwashing soap? What the hell's the difference? Furious, he started to bail outside the rain in the fallen hard driving sheets. This? Keeping her face adorable, admirably somber, she dressed her to the river running over the floor. This is the difference. If you use the liquid for hand washing dishes in a dishwasher, this is the inevitable result. <laughs> He straightened, the bucket in his hand, looked at so <laughs> and a look of such pained irritation on his face, she couldn't hold back the laugh. Sorry, sorry, look, turn around. Why? Because I'm not willing to ruin my shoes or my hoe, so turn around while I take them off, and I'll give you a hand. Yeah, perhaps <laughs> pathetically grateful, he turned his back, and even did his best not to imagine her peeling off her stockings. His best wasn't quite good enough, but it was the effort they counted. He even handled most of the kitchen chores when we were growing up. I did my share, but it doesn't seem to have stuck with me. He seemed to be out of your element. She stuck her hose neatly in her shoes, set them aside. Get me a mop, I'll swab. You get the coffee. He opened a long, narrow closet, handed her a stream up. I appreciate it. Her legs, he noted as he sloshed over for mugs, didn't need hose. They were pale. They were pale and fascinating in golden color and smooth as silk. When she bent over, he ran his tongue over his, his teeth. He had no idea a woman with a mop would be so attractive. It's so amazingly pleasant, he realized to be here with the rain drumming, the wind howling, and a pretty, barefoot woman keeping the kitchen company. You seem to be in your element. He commented, then grinned when she turned her head and eyed him boldly. I'm not saying it's woman's work. My mother would have skinned me for that. I'm just saying, you seem to know what you're doing. <laughs> As she worked her way through college cleaning houses, she knew very well. I can handle a mop, Mr. Quinn. Since you're mopping my kitchen floor, you ought to make a cam. About set. Yeah, about set. Do you mind if I sit down? Go ahead. She caught herself beginning before she began to hum. The mindless chore, the rain, the isolation were just a tad too relaxing. I'm sure you know I spoke with him yesterday. Yeah, and I know he told you he wanted to stay here. He did, and it's in my report. I also spoke with his teachers. How much do you know about his schoolwork? Came I haven't had time, a lot of time to get into that yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. When he was first enrolled, he had some trouble with the other students. Fist fights. He broke one boy's nose. Good for him. Can't that was surprised he took a pride, but he did his best to look disprimy. Who started it? That's not the point. However, your father handled the situation. At this point, I'm told that Seth keeps mostly to himself. He doesn't participate in class, which is another problem. He rarely turns in his homework assignments, and those he does bother to turn in are most oftenly sloppily done. Cam felt a new headache beginning to brew, so the kid's not a scholar. On the contrary, Anna straightened up, leaning on the mop. If he participated even marginally in class, and if his assignments were done and he turned in on time, he'd be a straight-A student. He's a solid-B student, as it is. So what's the problem? Anna closed her eyes a moment. The problem is that Seth's IQ and evaluation tests are incredibly high. The child is brilliant. Though he had his doubts about that, kid on So that's a good thing. And he's getting decent grades and staying out of trouble. Okay, she would try it. This is a different way. Suppose you were in a Formula One race. Been there. He said with a wistful remembrance, remembrance, done that. Right, and you had the finest, fastest, hottest car in the field. Yeah, he said, I did. But you never tested its full capabilities. You never went full out. You never punched it on the turns or popped it in the fifth and poured down the straights. And brother, you follow racing. No, but I drive a car. Nice car, too. What have you, what have you had it up to? 88, she saw a secret glee, but she would never admit it. I consider a car transportation, she said, lying primarily. Not a toy. No reason it can't be both. Why don't I take you out in the Veda? Now that's a fine mode of entertainment. 
entertaining transportation. Well, she would have loved to indulge in a fantasy of sliding behind a wheel, that slick white bullet. She had to point at me. Try to stick with the analogy here. You're racing a superior machine. If you didn't drive that car the way it was meant to be driven, you'd be wasting its potential, and maybe you're still finishing the money, but you wouldn't win. He got her point, but he couldn't help grin. I usually won. Anna shook her head. Seth, she said with admirable patience. We're talking about Seth. He's socially stunted, and he defies authority constantly. He's regularly given in school suspension. He needs supervision here at home when it comes to this area of his life. You're going to have to take an active role in his schoolwork and his behavior. Seems to me a kid gets based, he ought to be left there alone. But he held up a hand before she could speak. Potential. That potential jumped into my head by the best. We'll work on it. Good. She went back to mom. I had communications from your lawyer in regard to the guardianships. It's likely you'll be granted that, at least temporarily. But you can expect regular spot checks from social services. Meaning you. Meaning me. Can't pause a minute. Do you do windows? She couldn't help it. She laughed as she dumped sudsy water into the sink. I've also talked to some of your neighbors, and we'll talk to more. She turned back. From this point on, your life's an open book for me. He rose, took them off, and to please himself, stood just an inch closer than was polite. You let me know when you get to a chapter that interests you on a personal level. A roar came to hard knocks against her ribs. A dangerous man, she thought, on a personal level. I don't have time for much fiction. She started to step back, but he took her hand. I like you, Miss Manelli. I figured out why, but I do. That should make our association simpler. Wrong. He skimmed his thumb over the back of her hand. It's going to make it complicated, but I don't mind complications. It's about time my luck started back on an upswing. Like a Italian food. With a name like Spinelli? He grinned. Right. I could use a quiet meal in a decent restaurant with a pretty woman. How about tonight? I don't see any reason why you shouldn't have a quiet meal in a decent restaurant with a pretty woman. <laughs> tonight. The liberty eased her hand free. But if you're asking me for a date, the answer is no. First, it wouldn't be smart. Second, I'm booked. Damn it, Cam. Didn't you hear me, Hawkins? <laughs> Anna turned and saw a soaking wet and bitterly angry man caught two heaping back some groceries into the room. He was tall, bronzed, and fairly nearly beautiful. It's spinning mad. Philip took his hair out of his eyes and focused on Anna. The shift of his expression was quick and smooth, from snarling to charming in the space of a second armor. Hello. Sorry, we dumped the bags on the table and smiled. Didn't know Cam had a company. Despite the bucket, the mop held between them and leaped to the wrong conclusion. I didn't know he was going to hire domestic help, but thank you. Philip grabbed her hand, because I already adore you. My brother Phil came to the right. This is Anna Spinelli with social services. Can take your flamingo out of your mouth now, Phil. The charm didn't shift or fade, Miss Spinelli. It's nice to meet you. Our lawyer's been in touch, I believe. Yes, yes. Mr. Quinn tells me you're li you'll be living here now. I told you to call me Cam. He walked to the stove to top off his coffee. It's going to be confusing if you call all of us Mr. Quinn. Cam heard the rattle at the back door and got on them, especially now. He said as the door burst open and let in a dripping dog man. Christ, this bitch flew in fast. Even as Ethan dragged off his slicker, the dog set his feet and shook furiously. Anna only went to his water spray suit. Barely smelled her before. He spotted Anna. Then automatic pulled off his soaked cap. Then scooped a hand through his damp curly hair. Seeing women, bucket, mop, he thought guiltily about his money boots. Ma'am, my other brother Ethan. Cam handed Ethan a steaming cup of coffee. This is a social worker your dog just sprayed. Water, dog hair all over. Sorry, Simon. Go, sit. It's all right. Came later on. Fool was already slapping all over her. And Philip just got finished hitting on her. And I smiled blandly. I thought you were hitting on me. I asked you to dinner. Came crying. If I'd been hitting on you, I wouldn't have been settled. Can't sit this coming. Well, now you know all the players. She felt outnumbered and more than a little unprofessional, unprofessional standing there in the dimly lit kitchen in her bare feet, facing three big and outrageously handsome men. In defense, she pulled out every strap of dignity and reached for her chair. Gentlemen, shall we sit down? This seems to be an idle time to discuss how you plan to care for Seth. She angled her head to Cam. For the foreseeable future. Well, Philip said now, I think we pulled that off. <laughs> Cam stood at the front door, watching the neat little sports car drive away. The Zenon rain. She's got our number. Came on. She doesn't miss a trick. I liked her. Ethan stretched out in a big wing chair, let the puppy climb into his lap. 
Did you mind how the sewer cam meets Jessica with Cam Snigger? I mean, I like her. She's smart and she's professional, but she's not cold. Seems like a woman who cares. And she's got great legs, feel bad. But regardless of all that, she's gonna note 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 down every time we screw up. Right now, figure we've got the upper hand, we've got the kid and he wants to stay. His mother's run off to God knows where and isn't making any noises. At the moment. But if pretty Annie Spinelli talks to too many people around San Chris, she's gonna start hearing the rumors. He dipped his hands in his pocket and started beating. I don't know if they're going to court. I don't know if they're going to count against us or not. I don't know if they're going to count against us or not. They're just rumors, Ethan said. Yeah, but they're ugly. We've got a sh good shot at keeping Seth because of Dad's reputation. That reputation gets smeared, and we'll have battles to fight on several fronts. Anyone tries to smear Dad's rep, they're going to get more than a fight. Philip turned to Cam. That's just what we have to avoid. If we start going around kicking ass, it's only going to make things worse. So you be the diplomat. Cam shrugged and sat on the arms of all kick ass. I'd say we're better off dealing with what is than what we might be. Thoughtfully, Ethan stroked the puppy. I've been thinking about the situation. It's going to be rough for Philip to live here and commute back and forth to Baltimore. Sooner rather than later, Cam's going to get fed up with playing house. Sooner's already here. I was thinking we could pay Grace, do some of the housework, maybe a couple of days a week. Now that's an idea. I can get behind 100%. Cam chopped onto the sofa. Trouble with that is it leaves you with nothing much to do. The idea is for the three of us to be here, share responsibility for Seth. That's what the lawyer says. That's what the social worker says. I said I'd find work. What are you going to do? Little best. Pump gas, chuck oysters. You put up with that for a couple of days. Cam leaned for I can stick, can you? I'll start after the first week of commuting. You'll be calling from Baltimore with excuses about why you can't make it back. Why you don't stay here and try pumping gas or chucking oysters for a while. The argument was inevitable. It meant us they were both up and nose to nose. It took several attempts before Ethan's voice got through. Cam stepped back with a puzzled frown. Turn. What? I said, I think we ought to try building boats. Building boats, Cam said. For what? For business. Ethan took out a scar, but ran it through his fingers rather than lighten it. His mother hadn't loud smoking in the house. We got a lot of tourists coming down this way in the last few years. A lot more people moving down to get out of the city. They like to rent boats. They like to own boats. Last year I built one in my spare time for this guy out of D.C. Little 14 foot skiff. Called me a couple months ago to see if I'd be interested in building him another one. What's a bigger boat? The sleep cabin and galley. Ethan took the cigarette pack back. Ethan took the cigarette pack back in his pocket. I've been thinking on it. It took me months to do it alone in my spare time. You want us to help you build a boat? Bill pressed his fingers to his eyes. Now one boat. Talking about going into business. I'm in business, Philip Meyer. I'm an advertisement, and we'd be needing somebody who knew about that kind of thing if we were starting a business. Boat building's got a history in this area, but nobody's doing it anymore on St. Chris. Philip said, did it occur to you that there might be a reason for that? Yeah, it occurred to me. And I thought about it, and I figured it's because nobody's taking the chance. I'm talking wooden boats, sailing vessels, a specialty. We've already got one client. Cam wrote, Oh, we do not have done that kind of work seriously since we built your skipjack. It's been Jesus almost ten years. And she's holding, isn't she? So we did a good job with her. It's a gamble. Yet and on a single word was the way to Cam's heart. We've got money for startup costs. Cam murmured, Wait, <laughs> warming up to the idea. How do you know? Phil demanded. You don't have a clue how much money you need for startup costs. You'll figure it out. A roll of the dice, Cam thought. You like nothing better. Crawler's nose. I'd rather be swinging a hammer than a damn vacuum hose. I'm in. Just like that? Philip threw up his hand. Without a thought to overhead, profit, and loss, licenses, taxes, insurance, where the hell are you going to set up shop? How are you going to run the business in? That's not my problem, Cam said. Was going, that would be yours. I have a job in Baltimore. In Baltimore, I had a life. Came to Zoom. In Europe, Philip paced away, back, away again. Trapped was the only thing. 
I'll do what I can to get things started. This could be a huge mistake, and it's going to cost a lot of money. And you're both better considered that the social worker might take a dim light view of us starting a risky business at this point. I'm not giving up my job. At least that's one steady income. I'll talk to her about it. Came to side on a bit. See so yeah, how so yeah, it reacts. You'll talk to Grace about pitching in around the house. Yeah, see them. Yeah. I'll go down to the pub and run by her. Fine. That leaves you to do with such tonight. <laughs> He's not silly. Really Make sure he does his homework. Oh, God. Now, that's settled. Came back. Who's cooking dinner? End of chapter five.